Take your Bible, turn to Romans 11. <clears throat> That's where I'm going to have you start today, Romans 11. And then uh, you turn there and just kind of hold on to that. Let me read John 17, some verses I've been preaching out of. And God just gave me Romans 11 here, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to obey the Lord this morning. I'm going to mind the Lord. John chapter 17, verse 11. Now this is Jesus' prayer. Now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. And then verse 20, John 17. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also, which shall believe on me through their word. That they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee. That thou also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them. That they may be one, even as we are. I in them, and thou in me. That they may be made perfect in one. And that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them. As thou hast loved me. Now you pack that into your heart today. Jesus prayed that his father would love you as much as he loves his only begotten son. Nobody prays like that. Nobody prays that way. There's not, a, there's not a, another religion in the world. As far as I know, every religious Doctrine in the world, the person seeks their own or the God seeks its own or his own or her own. Do for me or do for yourself, whatever. In this one, our God said to, the Lord said to my Lord, love them the same way you love me, Father. That's just way over my head. I believe it. But it's hard, to, it's hard for me to grasp, it's hard for me to understand that kind of love. I try to live it, and I come up short a lot of ways. Now, I had you turn to Romans 11. <clears throat> I've been preaching on unity, being one, being part of the same body. And um, I asked the Lord a while ago to help me preach this. And uh, he just kind of directed my thoughts in this direction. So bear with me while I stumble through this. Are you there in Romans 11? Say amen. He said, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What ye not, what the scripture saith of Elias. What is sort of like, do you know, do you not know what the scripture saith of Elias, Elijah? How he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they've killed the prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Uh, let's see here. I want to move down to verse 11. Paul says, I say then, had they stumbled, that they should fall, God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation is coming to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now I'm going to stop right here before I read any more. And I'm just, I'm going to ask you, have you ever been with a person or a group of people? And before long, it became pretty obvious to you that you were in a one unwelcome place. In other words, they just started sending out vibes to you that they didn't really want you to be around, like get out 
You know, that's one of the vibes. You know, you just get this feeling that maybe I shouldn't be here. Get out, go on, leave us alone. You don't belong here. You're not one of us. Different things like that, okay? My nature is that I, I want people to be happy with me. I want people to accept me. I want people to like me, whatever. And it doesn't take much for me. You don't have to send me too many vibes. Maybe. If I'm really trying to suck up, then maybe, yeah, you have to tell me, would you get out now? But for the most part, if I feel like I'm not welcome, you don't have to ask me twice, okay? And uh, I just, I'm ready to move on, ready to go on, ready to get out of town and, and move on. I don't like to be, I, I have wanted people to like me. I've wanted people to find favor in me. I wanted to be uh, in with certain groups. And when I start detecting then that those people don't want me around, I don't keep trying to hang around. Just maybe, maybe if I stay, they'll like me. No, they're just, they're just going to hate you more. Okay? And I think probably everybody here knows a little bit about rejection. Okay? About not fitting in with certain people. Maybe you went to a church and you were there Sunday and just didn't feel right, so you didn't go back. Maybe you were there for a while. But after a while, it just became obvious that you just didn't fit in there and it just wasn't for you. And so you didn't, you didn't hang around. You didn't wait for an invitation to, to get out. You just got out. You left. Okay? Um, maybe you have been rejected by family members. Maybe you've had even family members just kind of let you know that they didn't really want you around too much longer. Okay, maybe you, need to, maybe you need to move on. You know, being rejected when we were young by a, by a boy or a girl, that's always tough, okay? It's even harder when you're rejected by a spouse, okay? You just, you find out that you just don't fit in to their plans and their life, Okay? There's a lot of people, a lot of people in this world and a lot of people in this church that have been rejected, kicked out. You don't, you don't belong here. You're not part of what we want to do, so move on. If you were Jesus, Jesus came, won't you see it from his viewpoint, Christ came into his own. What does it say then? His own received him not. His own people. Joseph. Joseph. The youngest of 12 brethren. Blood brothers to the end, right? Unless you were Joseph. And if you're Joseph, the brothers hate your guts and you don't know it, but they're planning your death. That's how bad they did not want Joseph around. They even mocked his dream, the dream that he had about him. They hated his guts. They saw it. They saw that dad loved him more than he loved the rest of us. So I guess maybe they're going to get back at dad and kill the one that he loved. Well, what kind of bro listen, to the, listen to that kind of brotherhood. What kind of brotherhood is that? That would despise their own dad and killed the very thing that their own father loved just to get back at him. Let me tell you something. If that's how they're going to be, you don't belong there anyway. You don't belong there anyway. Joseph tries then to be a blessing to his brethren. Now, all his brethren did was despise him in the end. So when they didn't kill him, they just had him thrown into, they sold him into slavery thinking, we've just done away with him. We're never going to have to deal with him ever again. Now, what goes around, comes around. Don't you dare call it karma. I'll, I'll wash your mouth out with soap. No, I'll wash it out with castor oil. That'll clean you out all the way. 
Joseph now standing in a position with his brethren in front of him 22 years later, he could have had every one of them slaughtered. And he could have mailed their body parts back to his dad and said, here you go, pops. This is the kind of treatment I get. That's not what he did. His brethren standing before him, he weeps. He has to leave the room because he's crying so loud. And why? Because he loved those brethren. Loved them. Would have done anything for them. And now he's in a position to be the greatest blessing in the world. Who was in charge of Joseph's life? God was. Every moment of it. Think of, uh, think of Ruth. She was a Moabitess, a Gentile. She marries this Jewish man. All of a sudden, father-in-law dies. Her brother-in-law dies. And then her husband dies. She had this Jewish woman, two Jewish or two Gentile uh, daughters-in-law, and no husband. And one daughter-in-law, the, the, uh, Naomi, said to the two girls, Listen, dad's dead. The boys are dead. There's nothing that holds you here. Go back to Moab. Go find you a husband. Uh, I can't raise up any, any child for you. I, I'm not, even if I were to marry somebody now, you'd be waiting 20 years before you could ever... Have another husband, so I have nothing left for you. Go back to be with your own people. And so one of the sisters did, one of the gals did, but Ruth. Ruth found a place that even though the, the Jews are strange to her as a Moabite, these are, these are strange people, they got strange ways, but I've never felt love more. Here's Ruth. I never felt love more than I just being with Naomi and her family than I've ever even felt with my own family. And it's, it was Ruth that said, Whither thou goest, I will go. And she, she pledged to never leave her. And then God used her for a tremendous blessing because Ruth ends up giving her firstborn son as the redeemer for her mother-in-law and say, Here's you go, Mom. This is going to restore the inheritance back to your family that you lost. And it's all, if you just study the scripture, there's all kinds of stories. Jesus himself does not, he's not born a Gentile Jesus. And all of our paintings of Jesus have a, has a Gentile look about him. We need to remember, he did not, he was not born a Gentile, he was born a Jew. He came unto his own. And his own spit in his face called him names, thrashed his back, beat him on the face, cursed at him, mocked him, hung him on a cross to die, despised him so much, and when he died, good riddance to him. Get that guy out of here. We, don't want him, we didn't want him around to begin with. We were, and I'm going to tell you something. Ha having, feeling rejected, that's hard. When you love people, you want to be around them. You want to, you want to give your life to them. And they in turn, they just kick you out on the street, shut the door behind you. And they don't, maybe they don't realize what they, what they missed or realize what they could have had because you would have gave your life for them. You would have done this. You would have done everything for them. And here they are, kick you out in the street. Well, that's the life of a Christian, to be honest with you. And you know what? Um... If you, if you monitor now how this nation treats its own president, okay? Well, for eight years, when I was not in favor of the president I had in office, I never took it to the streets. Okay? They hate that man. But let me tell you something. You're next. You're next. If we think that we're going to find favor in our own country, amongst our countrymen, we've got it wrong. They're going to turn on us. This is not going to be the land of the free and the home of the brave. And uh, the socialist America has been pushed back a couple years, but it's not gone, and it'll come back, and we're going to lose everything that we've fought for and worked for 
And when I shake these men's hands, I still get that, thank you for saying that to me. Thank you. I mean, these guys are stunned that I'll tell them that. They're going to lose everything they, they lost brethren over. They're going to lose this whole thing. And you and I are going to be hated out of our own country. The truth of it is, we do know what's best for the nation, don't we? We know God and Jesus Christ and this Bible and righteousness exalting it. We know all that, but they don't want us around. We could fix America's problems. We just get America back to the Bible. They don't want back to the Bible. So we're going to be hated out of our own nation. Okay? I was despised out of a denomination. When I, I honestly thought, when God began to deal with me some 20 years ago, I honestly thought, that my denomination would be glad to hear what God had shared with me and what God had given me. No. They said, we don't want him preaching at camp anymore. We don't want him teaching at camp anymore. We don't want him down here anymore. Take his, take his videos and... You don't sell those down here. You don't give those away anymore. Can I come? I ask, can I come be part of the, the denominational meeting there? Can I have a booth there? Well, we don't have room for you. Seriously? You don't have room? No, we don't have room for you. If you want to stand out in the parking lot and give them away, that'd be fine, but we don't have room for you here. That hurt. That hurt. And... I wanted that more than anything. I wanted to be in with the denomination. I wanted those guys to like me. And God said no. And I struggled with that a long time. I just came from a meeting. And those are some of my best friends in the world down there. They wanted me to come down there. And they want me to come back. I've been going to Brother Lonnie Burke's now every year since 2000. That's be 18 years this year. I've been going down there every year. Same thing. I get two hours on Saturday. Nobody gets two hours down there. I get two hours when I go down there. And more if I want it. They, they want me. And I love them. I love them. They're God's people down there. I don't have to go down there and fight with those people. Okay? But I was asked not to come to other meetings, and so I don't come. I don't show up. You don't have to ask me twice. I'm gone. Okay? So I get it. I don't like that kind of rejection. Jesus was rejected by his own people, but guess what? That's not so bad because it turns out there was a whole bunch more people all over the world that wanted him. And he's here now. What they, what they refused, us sitting underneath the table said, you can feed that to us, we'll take it. Amen. What's good, isn't it? So re read Romans 11. Let's, let's read this here. Um, verse 15. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is holy, and if the root be holy, so are the branches. Verse 17, if some of the branches be broken off, thou, being a wild olive tree, wert grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive vine, boast not against the branches. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then the branches were broken off, that I may be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith, be not high-minded, but fear. And I guess, I guess why God wanted me to go in this direction was, is that just Israel rejected Jesus, didn't want anything to do with him. So God broke them off, but look at there. Now there's a place for people who want to be in there. So he took us, he grafted us in, and lo and behold, it worked. We were from a, a wild olive tree. Wasn't sure if, the, God, you can put me in there. I'm not sure if I'm going to make it. God says, I know what I'm doing here. And grafted us into a place where we were instantly accepted. We're instantly blessed. 
God's going to use this. God is using us. God's going to use us one of these days. And the Jews, well, they just have to wait till it's, we're done with our turn. Amen. Okay? I'm just saying to you that just because you were thrown out, kicked out, asked to leave, felt like you were not do, not do any good there, thrown out, whatever, God's got a place for you. There's always a place for what the world throws away and what the world doesn't want. And if the world doesn't want you, fine. You didn't belong with them to begin with. That's what I found. If, the, if, if, those, if those guys that I looked up to all my life don't want me back, that's fine. Because there's people that never knew about me that want me around. I'll take that. So what if I was a castaway? I'll take it. So what if I was the refuse? You're looking at a whole church full of people that were refused, people that were thrown out, people that were not, not good enough to be part of somebody else's crowd. We don't fit in over there. We don't, we, you don't fit in with your own family. Why? Because you want to pray before we, have, before we eat. You're not going to drink wine with everybody else. You better not, and I find out about it. Amen? Well, we don't sit down with Miller Lite. We don't sit down with Budweiser. We're not going to that party. We're not going to that crowd. That's why they didn't want you to begin with. They don't want you around. I'm telling you, you found a much happier place or should have found a much happier place in with the people who accepted you for who you are and what you are and what you stand for and what you believe. That's good, amen? Uh, let's pray before I move on. For I, That was pretty good so far and I'm pretty sure I know how to ruin it, so I better pray. <laughs> Father, help us to preach. Lord, I know, Lord, the time's already long today. I pray, dear God, that you would just uh, open my mouth, shut it when it needs to be shut. But Father, thank you, dear God, for having me thrown out. I didn't belong there. I didn't see it, but I just, I didn't belong there. I thought I did. I thought I could really make a difference. But God, you knew better. And so, Lord, you've led me, you've guided me, you've done, you've done way more for me than I ever deserved. So, Father, I thank you for, for letting some people throw me out. I thank you for being a castaway. I thank you, Lord, that I don't fit in with some people, Lord, because those are people that, once I realized who they were and what they were, I don't want to be a part of that anyway. And Father, I pray to your God that you would just reach out to every heart, every person, Lord, listening to me today that has been a castaway, they've been thrown out, pushed out, mocked out, laughed at, called names, despised, rejected, ridiculed, and it hurts. The pain's real. But God, then take those people, the ones who are adrift, the ones who don't, who don't have a home anymore. They don't know where to go. Lord, let them find a home here. Let them find a home in your kingdom, your glory. Because if the world hates us, then so be it. But Father, we can fix the world. I mean, we, we, we keep saying to you, God, that if you leave us, we can do things, but God, we know you're wise. We know that your ways are higher than our ways. And Father, we just don't understand that you have a perfect way that you're going to use us. And it would be far easier and far greater for you to do it your way. And Lord, help us to see that. And help us, dear God, to be accepted in the Beloved when the whole world throws out. So, Father, just show me what to say today and show me what to do, and, Lord, I'll do it. And I love you, and I love your people, Lord. I want to be a blessing to them. And so you show me how. We pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen. I want to do um, Ephesians 2. Turn there in your Bible, Ephesians 2. It's already 12. If you've got to run, go right on ahead. And I'm being serious. I don't. I don't think you ought to. I don't think you have to stay around in order to be saved. 
But hear me out just for a few minutes this morning. Ephesians 2, verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off. Do you see that? Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I did not think about that being in this verse. This has been in my notes now for weeks. And I just now saw that. Now in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. You see, the world rejected you, didn't they? You don't fit in. You're not their kind. You're not their type. So you know what? Rejoice over that. Because now you who have been... Did you see that? We're not there yet. What's he got a naked man up on the screen for? <clears throat> you were thrown out. You were cast out. You were tossed out. You were rejected. You're adrift. And God made it so, so that you could be accepted in the Beloved. If you find a far better place, a far better people to be around, a far greater thing to do with yourself in life than what you were doing. Let me tell you, you're in good company. Everybody's sitting in this place next to you, and everybody watching and listening online, everybody's going to listen to this. You've been thrown out, cast out, tossed out, uh, cursed at, laughed at, mocked at, made fun of, and everything else in the world, and that hurt you, that bothered you, that tore you up, and you went to God crying and sobbing, God, what are you doing? Now you're in a far better place. Amen. Okay, you're made nigh by the blood of Christ. And all of God's people have the same blood type. Be positive. That's mine, be positive. Okay? That's pretty good, wasn't it? Some of you, if you can't help it being old negative... Right? Well, be positive. For he is our peace, who hath made both one. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about you and God. Christ has made you and God no longer at odds with each other. You're no longer at war against God. Christ is the mediator, and he mediated between you and God and worked it all out to where now you and God are at peace with one another. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you, which were far off. When God found you, he didn't find you at the height of your success in the lost world, did he? He found you at the bottom of the heap. He found you when everybody else rejected you. When, when sin had run its course in you, and you were sick of it, not when you were favoring it highly. Because if you favor sin highly, you don't look for Jesus, and you're not going to, he's not going to be found either. Because you still think sin is where it's at. You think the world and living for the world is where it's at. No, no, no. What God's got to do is God's got to let that run course in your life. Just like the prodigal son, he did not return to his father with all of his money left in his pocket, did he? He come back to daddy when it was all gone. And that's what he did for you. God let sin run its course, and you realize there's nothing left for me here. So why don't I go back to my Father where I know I'll be accepted? Amen? So he came and preached peace to you which were far off and to them that were nigh. For through him we, have, we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners. Amen? We're all, we're all Bethelites. No more Jews, no more Gentiles, no more... Whatever we used to be, we are Bethel. Whether the world likes us or not, we're Bethel. And I know some of you, and I know your story. I know your life, and I know you were kicked out of places. I know you were tossed out. I know you were asked to leave. I know you were thrown out and lied about 
and made fun of and everything else. And to this day, they don't want you back. That's good because they can't have you. Therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon. Now, watch this. Now, they, they, you're going to see that. You're going to see why I had a naked man up on this picture here in a minute. Okay, he was so naked, didn't even have any skin, just bone. Now, watch this. Are built. This is the house of household of God, God's house. Are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Does anybody know what that means? The apostles are the New Testament. Prophets are the Old Testament. Has everybody got that? Okay. Now, the prophets, the Old Testament, they were all Jews. They all came from one of the, the, the 12 tribes of, of, of Israel. The apostles, they were how many of them? 12. There's 12 apostles. And he, I'm getting to something here in a minute. So he said, it built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. So it's the whole Bible. We're, we're to build, this house is built on uh, the whole word of God, from Genesis to Revelation. Jesus Christ himself being the chief corner stone. In whom, look at the language now of your Bible. In whom all the building fitly framed together. Because if anybody knows anything about building a house... You don't just open a box, add water, and it goes poof. <laughs> Not yet. It's a piece at a time. Right? Well, how were you built in your mother's womb? Piece at a time. One piece at a time. And so, are built upon the foundation of the apostles. Some of you were going, and it didn't cost me a dime. Some of you were doing that. I know you. That's a Johnny Cash song. Anyway, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. You see, what you were going to be, what you were headed for, was to be the dwelling place of the Antichrist himself. Because you kind of figure, everybody on this world right now that doesn't get saved, that's who their master is fixing to be. You got it? See where you were headed? The man of sin was going to... Cheeseburger, hush that up now. That's my new nickname for him. And he's happy with it too. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto the holy temple of the Lord, in whom you also are builded together. Did you see the word together there? You're builded together. For inhabitation of God through the Spirit. Brother Sterling, does God dwell in you? Yes. Sweetie Pie, does God dwell in you? Pam, good. Linda, see, you're good. God dwells in you. Johnny, Ryan, Trish, sis, yep. brother Phil, God dwells in you, right? Okay. We're not, we, don't, we don't despise that, do we? Think of who you were and think of where you were headed and God selected you. God took the lumber. God took the stones that he wanted. God took the fixtures that he wanted. The ones for his house, the jewels for his house. He chose each one of you to make us an habitation of God through the Spirit of God. So now, watch this now. Remember that foundation of the apostles and prophets, right? Twelve tribes, twelve from where the prophets came from. Twelve apostles from where the New Testament comes from. So, in the body, in the human body. He's given us 12 ribs over here and 12 ribs over here. Remember now what, what I kind of taught about this. That your body literally is the temple of God, right? Because in Revelation 4, we have the temple, we have the heart. Your heart is the throne of God. That's the four chambers where on the throne of God there are four living creatures that hold that throne up. Well, that's the four chambers of your heart. And Christ dwells in your heart. That's the throne of God. Surrounding the throne of God was a sea of glass clear as crystal. Surrounding your heart is the pericardium. That's a, 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 a sea, literally, that your heart is surrounded by. It's just like the Bible, just like the, the throne of God in, in heaven. 
Then you had the seven spirits of God. There were seven candlesticks there. And the seven spirits of God, that's your two lungs. Because you have seven tubes that run down into your lungs that feed the rest of your body, that give your body life. Amen? That's what the seven spirits of God. Then John heard in Revelation 4, he heard thunderings, lightnings, and voices. Well, that's your heart. Your heart sounds like thunder. Or sometimes your belly does, depending on what time of day it is. But your heart sounds like thunder. It operates on lightning, electricity. Your voice box is here. And here's the pinnacle of it. John said, I saw the 24 elders dressed in white surrounding the throne of God. We have 12 ribs on each side, 24 total, that surround the throne of God. God built you to be His house. Amen. So watch this. See, you have the, the 12 apostles here as the foundation. You have the 12 tribes here as the foundation. Want to read the Bible? Read the Bible. Read the Old Testament. Read the New Testament. God's going to sh Just like I told you, Lynn, read the Old Testament for all. Read the New Testament. What happens is God will start connecting it together just like the rib cage is connected together. And all of a sudden, you start seeing things you never saw before. You start knowing things you never knew before. Okay? So whereas the world hated you, you, you now have a light. You now have a light in you that no Ph.D. in this world can ever give you. You're smarter than the world's top scientists. The chief medical people of this world do not hold a candle to you because you have a knowledge and a wisdom that surpasses they and all of their worldly education and they would laugh at you and call you ignorant and unlearned, unlearned and ignorant. That's what they called the disciples. They perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, but they perceived they had been with Jesus. And while the world may hate you because you're unlearned and ignorant, don't know the, all the, the, the evolution stuff and all that stuff, but you've been with Jesus. And He shines as a light of knowledge in you that surpasses everything of this world because you believe that God created this world in six days. Amen. Not 13 billion years. Six days. And He could have done it in one if He wanted to, but He chose six. He rested on the seventh, so you work six days and we rest on the seventh. It still goes that way, by the way. Amen? Still have seven days in the week. They're trying to change it. Still have seven days a week. But here's what I'm getting at. If the ribs are the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles, what is the chief cornerstone? It's your spine. It's your back. That's where the whole body is joined together by the chief cornerstone, Jesus Christ. Because Jesus was 33, and you have 33 bones in your back. Amen? Now, this is what made me a lot happier than it's making you. Because I liked it. When I was putting it together, I was tired as I could be last night. I said, oh God, I don't know what to preach. He is the chief cornerstone that we're all fitted together in Him. The world rejected you. Tell them thank you. People tossed you out. Write them back and say, you know, you did me a favor. I didn't belong with you to begin with. I've now found a home. I've now found a people. And I've found my place in life is to be with them. And nothing, and I mean nothing, is ever going to take that away. See those 33 bones? Out of every one of those bones is a bundle of nerves. You ever had kids get on them nerves? <coughs> Amen? Yet two bundles of nerves come out of both sides. 33 times 2 is what? How many books are there in your Bible? This is how God talks to you. This is how the head talks to the body. And this is how the body talks to the head. Just like in your body. And God chose you to fit in with all of these people and has joined us together by the same book. I don't have half the church reading the Chronicles and the Virgin Mary. I don't have half of you reading about Buddha and half of you reading about Muhammad and all this stuff. We're all reading and feeding off the same cornerstone held together as part of the bones of his body by Jesus Christ. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. Mm, 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 mm.
I don't think I'm going to preach what I was supposed to preach this morning. I think it's going to be different. First Peter chapter 2. Some, some things I want you to consider, and I'm going to let you go. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and evil speakings. So let me say something to you. Where you left, what they tossed you out of was malice. Which means people used you. They used you, and then they tossed you. And that hurt more than anything. Because they made you feel like you were special. Like, oh, we need you. When they got what they wanted out of you, gone. All those guys that hung around the prodigal son, why did they hang around him? Daddy's money. Yeah, daddy's money. And as long as he had daddy's money, he would fit in, he fit in everywhere. But as soon as it ran out, he went to all those people for help. And they didn't even open the door to him. Because they didn't have what they wanted anymore. They used him, and then they moved on to find somebody else to use, and then they moved on. It's kind of like some guys out in this world. Ladies, young ladies, you watch out what wolf you look at. Let's have some older women say amen. Watch out for those wolves. They'll tell you they love you. And they'll tell you all kinds of things. And then they will throw you away when they're done. Amen? By the way, there's ladies out there, guys, just like them. They'll use you. They'll take you for what you got. And then they don't care about you anymore. But you left that. You left the malice. You left the guile. We got a threatening letter from the denomination years ago. You remember this, Rose? Because we were not sending in money to the denomination anymore because we didn't want to be part of them. And they took notice of that. They didn't ask me where I was, how I was doing. They weren't getting money anymore. And when they figured out that they weren't going to get any money out of us anymore, and what really drove me was a preacher that I had looked up to. I idolized this man. Didn't come to me, asked me how I was doing. He came to me and asked me, where's the money? I'm not kidding you. Where's the money? And I just sat there. He said, you need to get that sent in. Boy, that hurt. They're full of malice. They're full of guile. You know what guile is? You know what it says, the serpent beguiled me? They'll lie to you. Their life is a lie. And that's all they know how to do is tell lies. They will lie to you. And then they will lie about you. They're full of guile. And those are the ones who threw you out. <laughs> Hypocrisies. They pretended like they were one thing. But you found out that that's not how they were at all, didn't you? They were hypocrites. They acted a certain way around you, but then you found out that they're acting somehow different when they're around other people. And the envies, well, that was on your part. 
Because it's easy for me to be envious of other churches and other preachers and how they seem to have gained the success. I would be envious of them, Brother George. How can they have a big church? How come I can't have a big church? I want a big church. And I was almost willing to start doing what they were doing to get that big church had God not stopped me. But I wanted to be them. I wanted to be in with them. I wanted to be accepted by them. I wanted to be liked by them. I wanted to be like them. And all I wanted was them. It goes back to high school. It was like, was like that when I was in school. I wanted to be of certain groups, certain crowds, certain people, this and that and the other. I just had a hard time finding out where I belonged. And the evil speakings, that's what they're saying about you now. Aren't they? Family members. Family members. You guys online, you've told me what your family members have been saying about you. You moms and dads with grown children cannot even talk to your own grown children on the phone. Because they, they're afraid that when you call, you're going to bring up Jesus. I said, they don't even want to talk to you about it. And when you get off the phone, you can just hear them going on about you. Talking about you. Talking about that church that you're hooked in with. That cult you're part of. And all they do is speak evil of you. That's all they know how to do. You see, they didn't turn into being that way. That's how they were. God just lifted the veil one day and helped you to see it. And it hurts. I know it does. But God did you a favor. Because, and this, this is why I'm so, so on this thing. If we come here, we're going to go to church here. We've got to feel loved here. Because if we don't feel loved here, why are we coming? There's other preachers you can listen to on the internet that are preaching way better than me that you can listen to. So if we're going to come here, then we have to be loved here. Because if we're not loved here, no reason to stay. Can I hear God's people say amen? So, you left all of that aside. You lay it aside and let it go. Because there's not a thing in the world you can do about it. Right? You got to leave Egypt. You got to leave Moab. You got to leave the, the kinsmen. You got to leave the people. You got to leave the scene. You got to leave all of that. Leave the money behind. Leave everything. But you find in God's people a far better place to be. And a far better people to be with. And we better make sure that we keep it that way. Or we will be the thing that they leave to go find the better place. See what I'm saying? Okay? Now, seeing as how I didn't know how to preach that, and I didn't know I was going to preach that, I don't know how to end it. Other than to say, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby, if so be that ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Have you tasted that here? 
You found that the Lord is gracious to you. And I want you to bow your heads. And I'm not going to keep you long. I know it's been long already. But I'm just going to ask you to visit with the Lord and have God make this what it is in your life. And God to make this church into the better place to be rather than the old place that we used to be at. You see what I'm saying? I want this church and I want you people that when you come in here you're loved and you know it. And you don't want to be any other place on Sunday. And in the middle of the week, you know that you can come here and you can find rest for your souls again. That's what I want this place to be. Father in heaven, I thank you, dear God, for taking the sermon. I asked you to. It had nothing to do with what I studied, it had nothing to do with what I was going to say. And I know, God, that it's been hard for some people to think on these things. And I'm sorry for that. But, Father, I love this church. And I love these people. And I want us to be a haven of rest. I want us to be a blessing place. I want us to be a birthing place for new souls to come in. I want your love and your goodness to flow through these people and out of these people. And I want it so that when we've had enough of the world, we come back into this place and we find that love again. And we find that peace and we find that acceptance here. That's all I care about. So Lord, would you do that? And Father, make me your first priority here. So I can be a pastor, Lord, that loves people, cares about them, that do anything for them. And that these people could be to one another that happy new place that we found. And we will ever call it home until you call us home to the next place we're headed. Father, dismiss these people in your love. Thank you, God, for showing us your will for today. Help us to love one another, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen.